are. All right. Uh, I apologize. I couldn't get my tablet up and running, so I don't have the agenda. So I'm working off the workshop schedule. But um, I'm sure the agenda asks for roll call, which um, all uh, <laughs> councilors yes, for exactly the first are available. <laughs> And then the second item, my guess, is the start of general government administration. Yeah. Um, my question for you is, are people satisfied looking at the budget that they have in front of them, or do you want me to share a screen and show the budget summaries? I, I'm fine with what I have in front of me. I'm, I'm fine with what's in front of me, so. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, if there's questions. I had a question, Cindy, uh, not Cindy, um, Sophie, um, just about protocol. If, as you're explaining, if we have, would you rather explain, like, do what you need to do and then have questions later? So or if there's a question, hope, yeah. So my hope is that with 182 pages of background, right. that we've done an awful lot of talking and that, um, we hopefully are gonna have be running this more like your questions and our answers or your thoughts and our scribbling so that we can go get answers or or follow up for you does that make sense cheryl it does it's just a, it's such a different format i mean we're in a different format so i didn't you know the mute and the unmute and how do we ask questions and things like that i guess i was just curious which would be the easiest and the and the best best way to I will, handle these meetings. I will defer to you guys because um, I work for you. So it's the meeting should be, the format for the meeting, Cheryl, should be what works for you guys the best. Okay. Um, I just want to let you know that my computer is glitching right now. So I'm, I'm in kind of a weird, like, <laughs> time, time zone here. Time warp, yes. Right. <laughs> Um, I, what if we did um, this type of a format where Sophie, when we get to the sub a department, if there's anything you want to say, you start it and then we'll ask questions. Okay. I think that's great. And I've got my team here. Shelly is going to join us, but she had to get to Lincoln um, okay. first. Um, but uh, for them to step in and, and deal with specifics. Um, okay. So if we start, We've done the general overview. I actually have a, a pretty cool document um, narrative that I'm about 60% of the way through um, that will go as a cover letter to this that should be helpful um, later on, but it says all the same things we've already talked about. Um, so my thought was that we would start right with the town council because you're the most important. Um, you will notice um, a very small increase in um, your budget this year. So your budget covers your salaries, a little bit of training, um, the general town-wide municipal dues for Maine Municipal Association and the um, uh, Maine Service Center Coalition that we belong to, along with the town portion of the audit, um, which is contractual, that's not, uh, we already negotiated that. Um, so you're up 6.28% um, or $2,300. It's primarily around the dues. We had dues increase from Maine Municipal and the Service Center Coalition. Um, and a little bit for audit, but it's the, it's what, that goes up a small percentage each year for, for the five years of the contract. It allowed us to start with a, a lower rate. Sophie, could I ask you to go back up a little bit? Yeah. And so on page five, your custom budget report expense, you have man REQ versus current budget change dollars. And then, oh, just one. So, yeah, all right. So we, um, this is a new report. I totally. Trio, our software system, we actually have the budget. We're running two budgets this year, the one that's in Excel with all the comments, but we've put it all into Trio. Zach has been very helpful. Um, so if you look across that page, 
you've got 2019 budget, then 2019 what we actually expended. On the budget, the previous budget years, we are not rep, uh, we're not picking up any of the carry forwards or any of the adjusting entries that were done. Um, but um, then you go into 20 budget, 20 year to date, 20 balance means what's left in that expense account at, um, thus far as of the 9th when this was printed. Then the manager is the draft budget. In TRIO, what you'll see is when council approves the budget, I will roll it and now you'll see town council, it becomes your budget. Um, manager's request versus current budget in dollars is the next line and then it's manager's request versus the current budget, which would be the FY20 budget percent change. That makes sense? I just thought you guys would like the historic, the history. Yeah, no, that makes much more sense to me. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the question that I had in putting this together is we maintained, um, council training at $1,000, and that has been an item that has garnered significant council discussion in the past. I don't know if you want to have discussion about that again. Anyone it, have Sophie, how, Sophie, how much have we spent in that line this year? Um, this year you spent 500, you spent, um, $444. I did pick up some council training um, in my professional services line for mm -hmm. you, but um, it's, I think it all depends on, this would be the season that you might do a little bit more professional development and we've kind of put the, the freeze, we've frozen that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think, Sophie, this year that there's going to be any face-to-face -face training or any group gathering training that's going to require travel? Um, probably not until after the first of the year would be my uh -huh. sense. I don't know if people have a different sense. Um, but I do think, and this will be kind of the interesting piece, Cheryl, um, I think that there might be more Zoom offerings which right. counselors might be able to avail themselves of and it should be at a less expensive cost. That's what I was, that's what I was thinking. And um, when is the MMA conference typically? October. Yeah, I don't, that's probably not going to go this year either. I would, I would doubt. Um, that's a big gathering. That's a, that is a big gathering. Um, and I mean, yeah, it, it has upwards of a thousand people at it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, Cheryl, I, I can't, I don't, Chris, I can't crystal ball the, uh, right. What social distancing is going to look like, but I just want to make sure this is your budget. This isn't mine. And I just want to make sure it represents what you want. I would say that I, um, look, $1,000 isn't a lot of money in the grand scheme of things when you're talking about multi-million dollar budgets. But, um, and, and of course there, there are certain legal trainings that we have to, we have to budget for. Um, in terms of having the sort of discretionary, you know, if something comes up, somebody can go to a conference. I mean, A, I think Cheryl's right. I'm not sure that there's going to be a lot of that happening in the next fiscal year and B I just think I mean of, of all the priorities is that the highest priority when there are other options out there for counselors to to learn things at a low or no cost um, right. I, I agree so what would you like to see that at leave it as leave, it it at, leave it at a thousand yeah I would definitely not raise it mm -mm. okay is there anything else on this page folks are interested in talking about? Can, can you speak um, just a little bit to the membership dues item that was a significant increase? 
Yeah, so that was an $1,800 increase. Um, primate, most of that came from the Maine Service Center Coalition, which we belong to. That's a group that um, really speaks more to Orono's uniqueness as um, a high tax exempt community um, looking at alternative um, funding sources for service centers in a way that um, Maine Municipal Association, because it has to meet the needs of smaller, more rural communities, just doesn't speak to. So we, um, Portland, I think it was the city of Portland dropped it, or South Portland, one of them dropped out and we had to redistribute the assessment. So that's part of it. And I wanna say that was about $500. The rest of that is looking at MMA's historic price increases because we won't get billed for that membership until the fall. Um, but looking at their historic price increases, um, I, we are, um, we've budgeted for what has generally come along for them, which is about $1,300. And Sophie, you think we get enough benefit from the Service Center Coalition to justify our membership? I do, I do. I think it's because the places that, um, that Orono really wants to push the state to look at differently and revenue sharing and the burden on um, low value, high population communities, which is definitely Orono, is, is really represented in that group. And I think we have a better chance of, of pushing our agenda there. Great. Thank you. And just for transparency, um, I serve on that board. <laughs> Not surprised. As a volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or comments about the? No. Nope. All right, Sophie. Why don't we move on to town manager? That would be me. So the town manager's office, um, we run um, all the things you would expect from the town manager's office, supporting council. Um, the council's clerk comes from the town manager's office, but we also run all of the non-payroll HR functions out of the town manager's office and um, all um, the finance director position essentially runs out of the town manager's office as well. So we have three full-time employees who are um, the manager and assistant manager. We have shared those salaries, split those salaries with the um, downtown and transit oriented TIF district to um, reflect the amount of economic development work that we do and TIF administration that we do. Um, if you look, at the bottom line, um, this department has actually decreased um, it for FY21 by about $1,900. Um, part of that comes, $1,500 of that um, savings comes from um, addressing public health in a little bit different way. Uh, this current emergency has caused us to formalize our public health response. So from the manager's office, this is now set up not to handle response costs, but rather to pay the $2,000 um, donation to the homeless, Bangor area homeless um, shelter. And then it leaves $1,500 for me to have at my discretion during the course of the year for other public health or social service needs. Um, Travel and training, we have reduced by $1,000. Um, this budget represents me putting on hold the um, professional development that I had talked with council about earlier this year or late last year. Um, but it doesn't seem like now is an appropriate time for me to do that when I'm asking my staff to cut back. Um, I did not cut it back further because my uh, labor professionals um, training 
is um, due um, at the end of next year, and I've got to um, get some of that done. And it's even if I do it online, it's going to be, I'm going to have to pay some money to do that. Questions, concerns? Okay. Um, Sophie, on your, um, in your narrative, your town managers, I had just a couple of, and it's not even questions really, but yep. you have a priority of improving communication and engagement with the public yeah. um, under for discussion. What was your, what were you thinking? What, what was your thought on that? So like what, it's a priority. How were you thinking that was going to happen or <laughs> expand? <laughs> So I think um, we have struggled for the last several years and Belle can pipe in and, and uh, come to the forefront because she's one of the prime people who is helping with this. But we've struggled for years to try to engage the community. Um, and it has, it's, it's a challenge. And so We've put some things in place, Cheryl, where like um, we've brought on Pete uh, Yazakavich to do more formalized social media posts and really keeping the, the website supporting that so it can be more live. So we're going through the website redesign, but I don't think the website is the only way to, to reach the public. And when I think about the coming year, I'd like to see us try to institute some standard expected um, communications with the community that then that social media foundation that we've begun to build can build off and hopefully push. But I, I think we need to, to um, work more with that. It, I'm not satisfied that we're, that we're doing all that we can in that. And I think part of the issue is just, I think we have to be very creative because I don't have staff resource to just be like, go do that. Okay. Do you, do you feel like it's budget related that, that you need extra resources to do this? Or is this just a priority for your office? So I think it's a priority for my office um, to, and also for town council. I, I mean, I think we have people who don't know what we do or what our role is even. Um, and the answer is sure. If I had money to hire somebody who did marketing and promotion and outreach, then it would be awesome. Um, but if you gave me that money, that wouldn't be the first priority I would have for right. it. So um, I think it's one of those things more about trying to find little building blocks Cheryl, that we can just start implementing with the finite resources that we have just to try to make it better. I see growth from last year at this time, which is yeah. good. Good. Thank you, Sophie. You're welcome. <laughs> I'd also like to ask a question about the narrative. Um, there are two items, uh, one under for discussion and then one area of concern that I imagine <clears throat> perhaps it might be helpful to talk about them together. Um, for discussion, you write council FY21 priorities in relationship to operational workload of the office and then areas of concern, vision goals and desired services outpacing the community's available resources. Could you talk a little bit or expand a little bit on those possibly linked objects? So I, part of the reason I put in for discussion, the, the FY21, council work plan um, and priorities is that given everything that the town manager's office manages that in other larger communities would have department heads, you'd have an IT department. You wouldn't necessarily have your assistant manager overseeing and running an IT department. Um, so, when we have all the op so many operational parts in the manager's office, it means that when council makes its priorities, um, there just needs to be an acknowledgement that there are great ideas that happen in other communities. We don't have a lot of resources here. 
So does it mean that it takes us that we have to chop those priorities up into smaller benchmarks to make them attainable? Does it mean that we need to scope those priorities down to, to focus, um, you know, really be pinpoint focused so that they're easier to manage? Um, so that's my first thought. My second is that, and I touched on it during the budget overview. Um, you know, I've lived in Orono for almost nine years and um, love it, absolutely love it. And I've made a choice to come here because of the services that we have and the quality of life that we have here. It feels to me like although our um, resources are pretty stagnant at best, that our vision and our desire for growth is outpacing our ability to pay. When you start looking at mill rates that are creeping up on 30, that makes it really hard for the community to pay. And so when we look at this particular um, budget year where we're taking a pause, we've done some things in this budget that are not good budgeting practices long-term. I think they think you can get away with them for a year while you wait and see what's going on. But I am very concerned that if this isn't a pretty rapid rebound out of this economic crisis, that we are going to be in a place where the community's vision truly doesn't come close to its ability to pay for it. And I think walking through what that looks like is going to take a lot of time. And while I so appreciate this council, its energy and its vision, in the past when we've talked about service level reductions, um, what happens is the we agree sitting at the table that that's an adequate reduction and that's good and it's 58 degrees, beautiful day, and then the winter comes and we are using those reductions, for example, with sidewalks, and my phone starts ringing off the hook, and oftentimes it's counselors asking me what I can do, and the fact is there's nothing I can do because we're not resourced for that. And if, we, if our revenues significantly decrease, decline, Council's going to have to talk about services that it doesn't want anymore and or that it wouldn't prioritize high enough to continue paying for. And I think that's going to be a really hard discussion to have, but I think it's going to be even harder because to make it on paper is a lot different than when your residents and the people who have elected you start calling because they're not happy. So that's kind of what, and my job is to be the is to be the canary, right? I'm squawking, right? I think that it can be difficult sometimes um, where um, there could be a sense in the community and even uh, on council of, you know, we live in this town, we should be doing this and we should be doing that. And I, I often agree with those impulses. We should be doing this and that and the other thing. There are lots of things that this kind of community, the, the way that we are, we should be um, leading the way on certain things or um, taking certain initiatives, we don't have the tax base to pay for them oftentimes. And that's tough. I think a lot of people in the community, um, they pay high tax rates and they think, well, I just want the government to do something. Like, why isn't the town just doing something and fixing it or starting this new program or doing this thing that, that the community wants? What do we pay taxes for? And I understand that that is a tough thing for just the average resident to wrap their head around. I think that for us as counselors, A, we need to be very careful about not contributing to the problem, and B, we need to be more vocal, or as vocal as possible in the community to, to explain and interpret and communicate these budgeting issues to, um, to the residents so that um, we can focus their attention in more appropriate places to actually maybe make change. But I guess I, I bring it up. I, I was, I'm happy to hear a little bit more explanation from you, Sophie, and I want it to be part of the um, larger narrative around 
budget season in general, but this budget season in particular, because I think we're going to have an even uh, harder, you know, task explaining and communicating this to the community, but it is our job to do that. So, <laughs> Sophie? Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, on the salary and benefit lines in, in this section of the budget, 25% um, of the salaries come out of the, the TIF. Is that correct? No, um, it is uh, 50, 20, uh, yes, 50% 50 of the assistant town manager and 20% um, of mine. Okay. And does the budget line reflect the total cost or does it just reflect the taxpayer cost? Taxpayer cost. If you look at the um, economic de economic development budget, the rest of it would be there. Okay. And do we do the same breakdown on the benefit lines in that section as well for the manager and the assistant town yes. manager? Yes, we Thank do. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything more on town manager? I had two questions that... Yep. Um, may not be popular, but um, <clears throat> as far as the Orno Observe mentioned in your narrative, but I didn't see it in the budget line, so maybe it's in finance. But no, it's it's in the TIF. Okay, because would we be making any savings going online with that? So sure, it costs. Um, Nancy would have to correct me, but about seven thousand dollars. Um, to print the observer and it nets down to about um, between $3,500 and $4,000 a year net cost because we have advertisers that also pay. Um, so right now, Cindy, on the budget side, we are recouping the advertising to offset the general fund. We're paying for it with restricted TIF funds because we are promoting the community and local businesses in it. Okay. Um, so a couple, several, I've been here. So I've been here long enough that I can't just say a few years ago. Um, but there, I did put a budget together that called for the elimination of the observer. And um, the that is what forced us to put it into, or that's what caused us to look at putting it into the TIF. Um, for two reasons, I had called because it's quite an undertaking for Nancy. She does an amazing job with it, but uh, it takes quite a bit of time and the cost. Um, and the feedback I got at that point from council was that the community was kind of split. We, while we had a bunch of people who were online and would see things on the website, um, there was also a concern that um, we had a population of folks who were not computer savvy or comfortable. And so four times a year, giving them the high points of what was happening was a way for them to get the information. Um, sometimes we put like the um, recycling, um, when the recycling schedule comes out, um, that would be in there and that could go on the refrigerator was kind of the, the feedback. So from your perspective, from my perspective, if we continue to sell advertising, I don't know whether or not our advertisers care if it's wholly electronic or if it matters that it goes into every single person's home. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the time that it takes to put it together, whether it's for electronic or um, getting it ready for print is the difference in time would be negligible. So it really is a matter of whether or not you want to expend tip funds in this way. Okay. And has the, has the advertising costs gone up recently? Um, we put those up, I want to say two years ago. Um, pretty, yeah, they, they're, they, they've gone up um, a substantial amount. Okay. 
Um, I don't know how other counselors feel about it, but I would almost kind of like to look at that. It, can we put it on a parking lot yeah. somewhere, <laughs> whatever you put it on? I, I, I would say, Cindy, that um, we're talking about ways to engage the public just a few minutes ago. Yeah. And it seems to me that, that multiple avenues to engage the public is positive. And um, if we didn't have this as a print sent to every home, I think we would lose one of the ways in which we do engage some of the public. That's just my opinion on it. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of feedback. I think that Nancy said the past two observers broke even. Oh, wow. So, um, in fact, she's been either breaking even or very close to breaking even. Um, there's a partnership with the school. The school puts in um, quite a bit of information and then uh, pays the town to send it out um, by mail, et cetera. So um, I don't know. We budget for some expense just in case the advertisers don't come in, but I think ultimately at the end of the year, we're often not spending uh, nearly that amount. So I think we, <laughs> we spend it but we just receive more revenue. Yes. Okay. And I'm okay with that. And then the other question is, I applaud the wellness program of the town, um, but I'm wondering what the $5,000 pays for. So $5,000 $5, we use in conjunction with other grant funds that we receive. That $5,000 pays for our work fit program. It pays for um, any consulting that we need, um, that we use. It pays for equipment if, um, so in, over in the public safety department, they have um, some workout equipment in the fire station. Um, if something breaks, we that's what we use to to fund that, um, the entire staff has access to that, or they used to before it all got locked down. Um, so that wellness um, initiative, Cindy, um, it's hard to quantify it in the budget, but we pushed it. Um, we've really pushed this program to, to, to do two things, to um, build a culture of wellness in the in the community, there's been research that shows that people who are out looking for jobs, professional people who are out looking for jobs are looking for intangibles um, in employment. And it's more about how does the employer show me that I matter? How am I important beyond the dollars in my paycheck? So one of the things the wellness program allows us to do is to acknowledge that our employees are important to us, not just the production of work. The research is really clear that people who are engaged um, are um, more productive. So the productivity is an important piece. It also complements our um, the methodology that we use in terms of HR, um, employee assistance, and um, compliance under the Americans with Disabilities Act for reasonable accommodations where we're really pushing folks to look not just at their physical health, but their mental health. Um, we're really looking at folks to learn how to advocate for their needs. Um, all things that ultimately um, help with civility within the workplace, which reduces employment claims. The final piece of wellness that's really important is that um, the town is individually rated on our health insurance premium. Not all of it, but a portion of it because of the size of our um, staff. There is a section of the um, premium calculation that looks at lifestyle claims. Those are claims that the actuary says are primarily contributable to how somebody is taking care of themselves as opposed to their genetics. So it's not whether you have diabetes, it's whether or not it's controlled. It's not whether or not you um, have um, a 
neurological issue. It's, is it, um, are you managing it with best practice and are you um, exercising so that you don't need some, as many drugs, that kind of stuff. We have been, so we implemented this program with help from our insurance company. And um, every year, Bell and I sit down with the executive director of the health insurance company and look at those lifestyle claims. And what we have seen um, is although our workforce, like all municipal workforces are, you know, we age and we have, um, we're not only dealing with people, we're dealing with their families that are impacting our, our um, loss ratio. So when we look at those lifestyle claims since the implementation of um, the wellness program, we have seen a precipitous drop, which has been wonderful and helps us in the long run. So how, why we are, part of the reason why we are not capping um, out on the insurance increases every year, um, why we had a 5% increase last year, as opposed to previous years where we'd been in double digits. Um, so that's my pitch for the wellness. I think it looks like, it might look like fluff, but it really is not. It is critical to the culture and um, the way we manage our employees. Well, if it's, if it's saving us insurance premiums, then it's probably money well spent, so. Um, I have a quick procedural question. I, I just got a message from someone saying that people are commenting on the live stream on Facebook, and I don't know whether um, council, whether we plan to so take questions. Bell, to them. Yeah. Oh, Belle usually is watching those and she will put them in the chat side. She'll say somebody is commenting. I don't know. Are you there, Belle? Sorry, I'm trying to manage multiple screens. Um, so I can read to you what the comments are. Well, very quickly, I just, I, well, I wanted to ask um, just because this isn't a meeting with public hearing or anything like that, it's just a workshop um, for council. Do we intend to respond to comments live as they come in or is there some other method folks would like to? What do you want to do, guys? <laughs> um, I personally want to kind of do the workshop if we can answer questions towards the end if we've got time or maybe the beginning of the next meeting or something. Um, I would appreciate seeing the, the chats, but I think we've got a lot to get through that I would prefer not to be sidetracked. I, I agree with that. So just do you want me to um, try and post those as we, as I see them come in or um, hold them and provide them to you after the um, meeting? I would find it helpful to see them just because then if it was something we were talking about, we could respond in real time. If, I mean, not respond directly to that person, but if they asked a question that was relevant to what we were talking about, we could make sure to mention something that might answer the question. All right, I will do my best to um, watch all screens. Okay. Um, if, if it gets too complicated, Bell, we can get it towards the end too. I, I just wanna to say too, on the going back to the wellness program, that that was also something that I had flagged as well. So um, I appreciate your, um, your, your, your definition. I was still wondering if uh, the decreased premiums are um, uh, balanced that X that five thousand dollars. But I think you answered the question. I don't think you you need to go on. But I had flagged it as well. Okay. So I do. I uh, Sophie, just FYI, I'm sitting here kind of looking like you guys were talking about certain things. Am I going? I don't know. I'm missing page 17, so if somebody could kind of just send that to me and I'll print it out, that'll explain why my subtotals were off. <laughs> I, I don't have a 17 either. So did you have a 17 after the 18? Nope. Nope. No. All right, just no 17. All right, then. I don't either. So <laughs> we'll get that fixed. Great, thanks.
I, but I'm not sure we're missing information. I, we might just be missing a page skip number. To number. Okay. My my seventeen is the um, narrative. All right uh, then. So we are missing it. Um, I don't think so. Um. Yeah, no, I think if you go back, I think we just have pages out of order. 17 is the narrative. So it just pages that got out of order. Hmm. Yeah, I see it. I apologize. Any other questions about the manager's budget? No, okay. Are we ready to move on to finance? Yep. All right. So um, the finance department is primarily supervised, um, comes under the town, is a subset of the town manager's office. We have a very capable um, finance manager in Connie Thorne who supervises a staff accountant and a, and a part-time clerk. The um, major change in this budget, it's a 13000 dollar increase in the budget. The major change comes in salaries and benefits. The salary increase you see here is because we uh, reclassified uh, staff accountant one at the beginning of the year to or at the this fall to staff accountant two because that individual was given lots of um, new payroll responsibilities and an expectation that they act um, independently. So um, that is the increase for that individual starting July 1. I think it's a 30 cent increase in their salary, in their hourly rate. The health insurance um, increase of, of 16,000 is based number one on projected increases that we will receive midway through the year for health insurance because health insurance always goes up. It never goes down. Um, the goal is to slow down the rate of increase. But the other piece is that um, we have a, an individual that had been functioning on a per diem basis for us for the last several years. It is a high qualification accounting position that we only want to use 20 hours a week. So our choice would be to have a staff person do that or to contract with an accounting firm for that work. Um, so we have an individual who's happy to work 20 hours a week. However, based on our um, general personnel policies, having somebody continue to work per diem for this amount of time at a general 20 hour a week level really opens them up to um, they're supposed to be getting benefits. And where this is not a temporary position and um, the general average work week is about 40, uh, about 20 hours a week, um, Connie started to talk to me about the fairness of not offering benefits to this individual. When we started to look at the position closely to um, evaluate um, a good compensation package across similar communities, what we discovered is that this individual's um, hourly rate was severely under market. And if we were to contract for this service, it would be, um, we would be paying much more. So when we had a conversation with the individual um, about kind of the long-term plan, employment plan, um, what they said is what they really are most interested in would be picking up health insurance benefits. Um, so when we think about the town paying a dollar in wages, so if we we're going to bring this person up to average, which is where we try to compensate our employees, um, we're paying a lot more for that dollar in retirement, FICA, Medicare, um, and workers' comp um, premiums. If I can provide that as a benefit, then that is the amount that I pay for that benefit is all that I pay. There aren't those additional add-ons on top of it. 
So um, in the interest of trying to be fair and equitable, um, this position is in the budget to be um, put on contract um, to offer the 20, um, to offer the health insurance, but to maintain that lower wage. So are we picking up 100% of the health insurance? No, um, this is picking up 75% of what we would pick up normally. So 75% of 75%. Okay. And that do, we have, do we have other part-time employees that are receiving benefits? So under the ordinance, if somebody is a scheduled 20 hour a week employee every week, they automatically qualify for prorated benefits. Vacation time, sick time, holidays, um, insurance, all of it. This individual, part of the reason we want to put them on contract because it's a high functioning professional position, we can do that under the ordinance, is that um, this individual is agreeing to give up sick time, vacation time, um, those other benefits that they would have and simply the thing that this individual wants is health insurance. Gotcha. And yeah. So, so that's the increase. This individual doesn't get earned sick leave or earned nope. vacation time? Nope. This individual does not. And how common is that across the staff that work for us? So this individual is in a highly unique position because this individual normally works closer to 45 weeks a year for us as opposed to um, 48, which because normally people would not work 52 full weeks. Um, so he is unique in every way. There is nobody else like this individual in so many ways, but also schedule. Um, so um, if people are 20, we don't have very many part-time people with the town. Um, so we have um, one other permanent part-time person and that's it. Um, and that person works 20 hours a week and gets half benefits, all, all benefits, half benefits. Um, Sophie, this person's a contract, is under a contract anyway, so they're a little bit different than just a part-time employee. Is that right? So the plan right now, this individual is per diem. And the reason for that is because um, if they were part-time, they would be required to be here 20 hours a week every week. And the relationship we have is a 45 hour, a 45 week relationship, not a 48 or 52 week relationship. So um, the plan would be to put this individual on contract, which then gives us flexibility. It's really hard to classify this individual as a um, per diem at this point in time, um, even though that's how it kind of functions. Yeah, but as contract, we can we can then give health insurance, but not give some of the yes. other under yes. the contract, yep. which is different than just a, a yep. regular full time employee. So the under the contract, what happens is the employee and the town are sitting down and agreeing, and, and essentially what I said was this is the going average rate for for this position for the number of hours you work in a year how would we, how, how, how should we best um, allocate those so that your needs are met? And part of the issue that we have is sometimes we have a need for it to be more than 40, uh, more than 20 hours a week. And sometimes he has a need for it not to be here for the week. And it just, it has worked very well as an ebb and flow and the contract would allow us to continue to see those nuanced differences. That makes sense? Questions or concerns? It, it makes sense to me. Um, thank you for the explanation. Sophie, how does Maine PERS go down 3%? So 
So it when we um, make an error in the calculation in the year before where we picked up um, a too much percentage um, because they hadn't formally adopted it yet. So we had budgeted a little bit too much. Not, I mean, as you can see, we're talking about a couple hundred dollars, but um, so this year, because it was a multi-year plan, they have it all out for the budget. Anyone else have anything in the finance? No. Yeah, I do. I have a question. I'm on the at the very or on page twenty-four. Um, postage increased by a thousand dollars. I was just curious about what that was all about, and um, and then professional services went down by five thousand yep. dollars. So those two end ones. So. Um, postage we had um when the postage when stamp prices went up we did not we tried very hard not to go up in the budget we thought we would just reduce what we needed to send and what we are finding is that we're actually sending more because people want reminder notices and then people want reminders of their reminder notices before we even get to the final formal notice, number one. Number two, this covers the costs of certified mails which have gone up significantly for us because a certified mail doesn't do us any good unless we have the return receipt requested, which at the end of the day ends up being like $6.35 a, a letter. Um, and what we've learned over time is without proof that it has been received, the town's whole process is not valid because if we can't document it, it didn't happen. So um, that's what that, we are overrunning that this year. Even if you don't see it here yet, I've, I've authorized um, expense that likely will end up having to cover from another department. So okay. that's postage. Mm -hmm. Professional services, um, for many years, we ran payroll through Bangor Payroll Company, and then we transitioned to um, ADP, as you recall, we, we transitioned. When we transitioned, we kept our access to the um, Bangor Payroll software information, and we had to do that for a few years because we're still running reports frequently um, looking for that data um, and they were reports not just internal reports but external we have been able to um, pull that data um, run the reports the final reports and um, create um, a file this year which means that we will not need to um, maintain the Bangor savings account payroll access so we've actually gone, taken the step to close that account. I signed all the paperwork on that earlier this month. Um, and without, so that's part of that decrease, about seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars of that. And then the rest of the professional services, we pay base price to ADP. Plus, when we have additional needs, we get billed per hour. Um, my staff is getting really good at figuring out the additional needs without having to go back to ADP. So based on our um, based on our um, use, we've asked ADP for their estimate for next year, and um, it came in at about twenty, almost twenty five thousand. So my thought is that. If we have needs that cause us to exceed the twenty-five thousand, we would um, go ahead and pay for those out of managers professional services because that's what it is. But not that budget line isn't going up this year. Thank you. Anyone else in the finance department? Um, is everyone comfortable with going for a contract for this per diem person? 
Yeah, I think that our finance department does an excellent job with very, very limited resources. I mean, our town manager fills several roles in that department uh, in addition to her uh, regular duties. Um, and this, this individual is willing to, I mean, first of all, we don't want just any old person who's willing to work, you know, per diem or for 20 hours a week. Um, we have a great employee that is willing to work on this particular contract um, and, and they, you know, basically just want to be um, insured. So I think that it makes, it makes a lot of sense um, to hang on to uh, a valuable employee. And especially, um, I think it maximizes and leverages our very, very um, limited resources in this department. I think, uh, Cindy, I think Sophie said it well when she said it's a unique position and a unique individual. And uh, so we have a unique compensation plan. Yep. No, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, 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 it's on the finance department. Connie, yeah. have I Not represented? Have I represented? Is there anything what you want to add? I thought you did a great job. <laughs> okay, I guess we will move to debt and other. So the, the debt, um, we are bringing on uh, new debt this year, which you had already approved, which is the street lights. Um, street light you'll see it as $25,000 principal payment and a $4,600 um, $4, um, interest payment. That um, we're actually going to end up ahead of where we thought we would be with the streetlights. We're seeing so much savings on the electricity side. So um, that's a seven year note. Um, other than that, um, all the debt is existing debt. It's up. We're going to, I'm sorry, we would um, save total about $15,000 this year, and it's just the cycle of debt. The one piece of debt that is not on your general fund um, spreadsheet is the balloon payment for the economic development um, bond. Of, it's a little over a million dollars due. It's the final payment. Um, as you recall, we have a signed fund balance that came in when the um, building was sold, when OEDC sold that building and we got reimbursed for the bond cost. So it's not here. However, it is, um, is going to be a cost that will reduce fund balance by about a million dollars. It's just not a general fund cost. So that's debt. Any questions on debt? Um, I have a question and I just don't know what this means. What does GOB stand for? General Obligation Bond. So okay. <laughs> the town of Orono has two different types of debt. Um, when we go out to First National Bank for those, I he hesitate to say smaller, but they are. They're usually under $200,000. Those are loans. They're conventional loans that if the town didn't pay, um, First, Nas um, First National would have to come after us in a conventional way. When um, we float bonds or when we have big loans, we tend to, um, those general obligation bonds are uh, loans, but they're backed by the full faith and credit of the taxpayers. So they're actually, we're in it's a different legal position. Um, but for us in terms of um, getting the money and expending the money and then having to pay it back, it all kind of looks the same. It's just the legal different difference. Um, I had another question too. And does it matter? It says we've got a couple that are scheduled to be paid off in this, this coming budget year, yep. right? Yep. Does it matter when in the year that this happens? It all depends on the bond, um, Cheryl. So for example, um, when we look at the um, First National Bank EMS equipment, 
um, right. if, if that was scheduled to be paid off in December and we had the cash to do it in July, I would do that because then I would save a little bit of interest. Right. With the general obligation bond, you're not allowed to advance refund them. You're not allowed to um, pay them off early. So even if I sent the check early, I'd still have to send it for the entire interest price. Okay. So if so we pay off, if we pay off the, um, I'm looking, they're kind of separated here. Yeah. Um, EMS equipment and the SCBA equipment, does the interest rate go down? I mean, would you pay less interest if it was paid off faster, I guess? So it, it like, all depends on the date. So some that's of what the, I was I wondering. One of these, I think one of these, the date of um, the, the loan is due is like August or September. Okay. I wouldn't pay, want to pay it before tax bills came in anyway, because we're usually right. cash flow is usually a crunch. Um, but what I do with Connie um, is when we look and we'll see when taxes are coming in, what payments are due, because the other, the other issue we have is that the county tax is due in the fall and that's almost $700,000. Well, it's over 700 this year. Um, but we look and if there's a benefit to us to save money, um, we absolutely would try to do that. But it's the size of these loans, it's really not a lot. And remember, these are 2% loans. They're pretty, pretty small. Thank you. So when we, are we ready to talk about the other? So the other, um, we are, although we have phased out the retiree group life insurance benefit, um, retire, people who did retire under that program, we are obligated, contractually obligated to continue to pay that premium. So that is, really don't have a choice with that one. Flex account fees um, are, the fees that we have to pay to our third party administrator for our dependent care and medical reimbursement accounts for our employees. If we were to eliminate that program, um, we could only eliminate or want to, we could only do that for the non-union staff because it is part of collective bargaining agreements. And some of those fees are flat fees. So you don't, you're not gonna see um, the significant savings that you would hope for if you tried to eliminate that. Maybe you might get $2,000, maybe. County tax, we have no control over. It has been assessed, it is a known. The um, school assessment is based on the latest information I got from the school, which is up $567,000. And the animal orphanage, we moved that line. It's now in the police department because Josh is responsible, police chief is responsible for managing that contract. That is a mandatory um, cost in terms of we are required by state law to have a relationship with an animal shelter. So there is no choice there. The bus. Bell is trying to work her magic with the city of Bangor and the regional transportation group. We have um, two separate bus arrangements, one that we pay for on the general fund, which is our assessed share of the community connector. So that's the orange bus that goes through all the communities. And the other is our individual a relationship with the Black Bear Express. So the university and the town share the cost 50-50 for that. The community connector expense is um, slated for next year to be the same as the current year. The city of Bangor got a significant chunk of CARES Act money aimed at transit. So we are currently in discussion to see if there's any way for any of that to be applied to the FY21 assessment. So we will keep you posted on that. Right now it is in the budget because the decision has not been made. It is certainly not, um, Bell has been advocating 
fiercely to try to reduce this cost for the coming year. Um, and Sophie, will they also give you some safety, um, you know, with this, with this virus on this bus? Um, I know it probably wouldn't be anything that I would be taking in the near future. And also, if the university doesn't come back in September, will we need the bat? I mean, it's, so, I, mean, we're, I mean, I know this is all, you know, speculation because we don't really know what's going to happen, but California's already closed their, their colleges for, you know, for September. And there's a good chance that our kids won't come back. So when it comes to the Black Bear Express, the town and the university have um, all of the say in whether or not that gets provided. And if it's not running and they don't have expenses, our costs will go down, if not to zero there. That's all funded out of the downtown and transit oriented TIF district. The community connector, which I think used to be called the BAT, Bangor Area Transit, I think, um, that is a, we have a different contractual relationship. We, there is a community group called the Transit Partners, which include all of the towns that are assessed um, part of the cost of the community connector. They get together and they can advocate, they can ask, they can cajole, they can demand, but ultimately the, um, the choice would be either we're going to participate or we're not. So if you look, think about the process that the town of Hamden had to go through to cut a route that they wanted, or I think there was Saturday that they didn't want, or it is a long legal process. So even if we were deciding as a town council that we didn't want to have this type of expense in our budget, that's something that we would have to notify, probably work with the Bangor area transport comprehensive transportation planning group um, to talk about how we could begin to reduce our costs a bit for that. But that would be something that even if we wanted to do it, Cheryl, we would probably start that conversation, have to start it this year and have either a year or two before it hit the budget. I would also want to know what they were doing as far as safety goes with masks and distancing yep. as well. So we have, um, we have put some information out on sa um, Facebook that we got from them. They are loading from the, the back, um, not the front so that they're not loading near a driver. There's a limit of 10 people on the bus. People are supposed to wear masks. They are not taking tickets money. There, it's, you're supposed to drop your tickets. It's not a hand transfer. Um, and a lot, of a lot of sanitizing going on. Um, actually, they're not even collecting um, fares at this. Oh, okay. I'd also just like to, um, and thank you for the explanation of the, the legal ramifications, Sophia. I'd also just like to jump in and remind folks that um, with appropriate safety precautions. There's no reason why anyone should be afraid to ride the bus. Uh, this is a lifeline for a lot of people in the community. Um, having a car is a privilege and I think it's easy to forget that. So um, I, I would not personally be in favor of making cuts to a program that serves a, a traditionally underserved population in the area. Maine's a tough state not to have a car. So, um, that would not be something I'd want to explore in any case. I agree with you also. I, I, I don't think that would be a smart move either. I think the place we're trying to come from, from staff is, um, you know, when we think about transportation planning, we clearly value um, public transit. We run our own internal um, bus. Um, the place that I think would make more sense, especially given the current, um, economic climate is to look at how we could utilize those federal CARE Act dollars to reduce our, our assessment this year coming up. I think that would be the, that would be the ideal situation. And just as a point of reference, I saw the 
connector bus this morning and the driver wears a mask too. So. All right, anything else on insurance or other? I mean, excuse me, debt service or other? No, we're good. Moving on to insurances. So your insurance information is actually further in the budget because I couldn't break it out um, because it's embedded. So it actually starts on page 50, just so you know. Um, this, we are suggesting as a money savings that um, we not allocate the $5,000 towards unemployment payments. We have approximately $40,000 in the unemployment reserve. We are seeing an uptick in um, claims. We are a self-pay. Um, so that is what that reserve is for. Um, unless the, the council is looking to um, begin to lay people off, which I think we would, um, we could we would approach differently. Um, the not having the five thousand dollars raised and appropriated this year um, would not um, hinder our ability to meet our our statutory obligations. It just means we'd be pulling from the reserve instead of the operating budget. The um, risk premiums. Uh, you will notice that um, I have kept them the same as last year and I've done that because looking at our loss um, runs, I think we're gonna be in a similar position as we are this year. And um, I am hoping that we will continue our tradition of some reimbursement of premium. So even if I'm a little bit off, it won't be by very much. And I think it's a um, responsible, um, way to, to uh, recognize the work that staff has put into um, managing their losses much better. Um, safety initiatives, um, that is, we've cut that back to $1,000. That um, funds our safety, our manual, our annual safety training day that we pull all staff in to um, get that um, across the board um, messaging and training around being safe and addressing uh, loss run concerns. Is that safety day something that's mandatory? Uh, no, no. Uh, so I will tell you that um, it is in each department, they have mandatory training. There are times that we manage that mandatory training if there's something that everybody across the board needs that um, we will do it through safety day. Um, in safety day, we approach more of the general safety concerns. So for example, when um, MMA was seeing um, a significant uptick in employment claims, uh, we went, I, can't remember if Bell went with me, but we went to a training that was entitled something like Civility at, at um, City Hall. And what that talked about was the underlying um, similarity in many of the employment claims seen across the nation from municipalities was around um, inappropriate work environments. So on one of our safety days, we took a couple of hours and broke into groups and we talked about how to communicate effectively, how to address and see what those issues are. When we look at lost runs, one year we were seeing a lot of um, back injuries, so people were not lifting appropriately. So we had hands-on lifting training. We've done um, a year that we had just some, I wouldn't say silly because nothing is silly, but the absolutely avoidable um, accidents that were happening because people were not slowing down and paying attention. And so we focused uh, four hours of training around um, how to slow down, 
pay attention scenarios, um, broke it out for each individual group. Um, we use that opportunity to also, we always feed in um, the whole question, the whole issue of employee um, assistance programs, which we don't think people are availing themselves of, and that doesn't cost the town anything. So we have lots of, um, we try to use that day instead of paper and pencil as a more hands-on day that we bring in people from the community or um, other safety experts to help make the connection for people around the issues to connect behavior and the way people are approaching their job with safety. Making sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, Sophie, and I know it's not that, ex that much, but would this be something that we could look for grants to, to cover, um, you know, in whether it, if we're looking for areas to reduce <clears throat> so when I think about a staff of 80 people total that um, and the culture of safety that we have built to allow us to have a loss run you know an experience mod in the 0 0.7 0 0.8 range. Um, this, the annual safety day has been, I think, a way of um, maintaining and highlighting that culture of safety. And Bell runs the safety program. So I don't know, I noticed you took your black screen off. Yeah. So um, one thing that safety day also helps us with is our um, rating for our insurance. So um, it used to be called the leader program. It's going to be a different name this year, but um, one of the questions they ask is uh, around the culture of safety and do you do, um, you know, entire team meetings about safety and um, deliver the message to everybody. So, so that, um, leader, that leader program saves us $10,000 a year on, on our premium. Yeah, so I, I mean, I know it's only a thousand dollars, and I'm what I'm trying to do is where can we see reductions that wouldn't wouldn't reduce employees, and so that's that's kind of the things you know. There's a lot of things that are mandated we can't get rid of, too. So that's that was just my thought. Um, we can come back to it at some other time. Um, anybody else have anything on? It seems if it's saving us with insurance premiums, then that's a good investment. Besides that, uh, that does reduce the, the incidence of accidents, which is great. Yeah, that's reasonable too. Um, anyone else have anything on insurances? Moving on to assessing. Mike's been waiting patiently for this. So Mike, are you all set to just take it? Yeah, sure. Just, uh, I'm working with two, two mice here. I'm in my office. I grabbed the wrong one, so I couldn't get it unmuted. Um, <clears throat> assessing, as always, is a pretty straightforward budget. Uh, overall, this year we're looking at a 3%, I believe, reduction. Yes. Um, no, no capital expenditures, no major purchases. Um, I think the only increase in the entire budget was a, a software licensing fee that's associated with our mass appraisal program trio. Um, sort of out of our control, just uh, an increase that they pass on to us. I guess with that, I, I would open it up to specific questions if you have any about the assessing budget or assessing in general. I didn't, 
I didn't have any questions about this, and it, it looks nice at the embassy, minus $4,000, $4,200. So, yeah, good job. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to run, as I have in the past, I, I run my department like I run my personal finances. If there's extra money in there that I know is not going to be spent, and there's that mantra of, well, if you give it up, you don't get it back. But, you know, I, I think you run it, you run it, for what you need and, and nothing extra. Any questions for Mike? Um, I just had, how is our um, reval going? <laughs> I, I knew I wouldn't get away from that. Uh, thanks, Sandy. Sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm, uh, very far behind on field work. Um, as you're probably well aware, it's not appropriate to be out traipsing around and through people's properties given the current situation. So as as these um, limiting factors are reduced, I'm going to regroup and, and see where we are. I mean, you know, as in, in my summary information, I'm going to do the best I can to get as much done as I can and you know, depending on timing, I, I had a good schedule set with, with what I could do and, and how I was going to do it. And now I'm two, going on three months behind or soon to be three months behind on, on field work. So fortunately, um, Jessica, who we hired as our uh, part-time clerk that serves multiple departments, is doing a phenomenal job. She's picking up really quick, and, and I think... Uh, She's going to be an asset to me helping push this forward, uh, this project forward. So at this point, I'm just waiting until I can get back in the field and, and do some inspections. That, that's it. Will we, will we have money from this year's budget moving forward as part of the revamp? I believe there is a carry forward in there, yes. Okay. Anyone else have any questions on assessing? No? Nope. Appears everyone's happy with it, Mike. So. That's good. Okay. That's good, I guess. <laughs> now, could you just clarify in the areas of concern, uh, just the vocabulary? It says it's po it is possible some of the remaining properties single family may have to be completed by vision with a capital V as part of the town-wide reevaluation. So that's not you, that's some out, uh, external group vision? Correct, Lori. That vision is the company that we contracted with to do the uh, multifamily, which would be three or more, as well as commercial properties. Uh, they were hired and have actually um, completed the bulk of their field work. They still need to do market studies and some other stuff to, to be finished. Um, again, it all depends on timing. If, if, if I'm able to get everything done, prior to April 1 of next year, fine. If I'm not, then I may reach out to them to help with some of the single families and multi the two families that are, that are left. And we did budget some for them anyway, so this is not gonna be a new expense. This is part of what we're using that carry forward for. Thank you. Cindy, um, Belle has asked if, uh, given the fact that she is gonna be with us tomorrow anyway. If we could skip to administration for Shelly so that Shelly doesn't have to sit through another meeting tomorrow instead of going to IT. <laughs> fine, fine with me. So are we ready to move on? Okay. Um, in the um, town clerk's budget, you will see um, that it is, um, it is um, up um, $14,000. That is primarily due to um, some changes in health, insurance premium selection, uh, plan selections due to change in um, personnel. And the $3,500 
in increased salaries here is based entirely on um, new um, personnel work making those steps that we had talked about earlier. Um, so they have been promised to those employees because they have met um, benchmarks associated with their positions. Um, Shelly is the town clerk who's in charge of overseeing town clerk elections and general assistance. And so I don't know if it makes sense for you to ask her questions or if there was anything. The other, oh, the other piece of this budget was that um, Belle and Shelley had originally asked to add a half-time position, which brings us back to a level of staffing out front that we used to have, which was um, two and a half people plus a town clerk. Um, as part of the cost savings, we pulled that 20 hour a week position. However, we have um, a presidential election and the fact that the front desk has been inundated with back office work. It's part of what they do is to serve the public, but the other part of what they do is around tax collection and liens and um, reporting for all of the state programs that we are required to run. Uh, so the, in order to save the money, our proposal is that we would move to a four day work week that we would be open to the public. Last time I recall the hours, it was 7.30 to 4.30, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 7.30 to 5.30 on Thursday and um, not open to the public, but working the balance of the 40 hours on Friday. Um, Friday is our lowest traffic time uh, when we look at the number of people coming in. Um, we have more people hanging out before eight, so we thought it would make sense to open at 7.30. Um, our, we have hours or had hours before Corona um, to six o'clock on Thursdays. And what we saw is um, that being used till about five o'clock-ish. So we thought 5.30 would make sense there. By not being open on Friday to the public, it gives us the ability to wash any overtime as well. So it, it allows us to um, stay within our budget a little bit easier. So that's the way this budget is laid out right now. So um, I'm one of those people that, you know, has to work till five. So 5.30 can get tight. Um, so I'm just wondering whether at six o'clock still makes sense, but I don't know how much traffic you have from 5.30 to six. So there hasn't been a lot of traffic between 5.30 and six, Cindy. And I think the other thing that this allows us to do is somebody walks through the door at 5.30 and we have the ability to stay and manage the whole transaction without incurring overtime costs. Because the next day, if they're there for an extra half hour, they'll just leave a half an hour early and we don't have to worry about meeting the cash handling requirements with the number of people that are there because their cash won't be out on Fridays. So um, I think that is helpful. The other thing is that we, you'd be surprised how many people call and say they have to sneak in under the wire and we manage to either open a little bit early or stay a little bit late for them. So for me, I think the hours should represent where the bulk of the population needs and then other people can continue to contact us and either do things online or um, through the Dropbox or by making an appointment. I think people are getting very used to uh, the need for things to be online more, more often than not. I think that we can also, I mean, trying to, to push uh, residents to use make use of a lot of those online services has been something we've been trying to do and we can continue that process people might be a little more open to it now that every most things are happening online um, so we've been hearing for years now that um, the increased demands of that office not only just um, you know municipal business but because there's so much work that the town office has to do on behalf of the state um, that we have had a crunch in that office um, 
the, the balance of being able to give good customer service versus all of the back office work that needs to get done that seems to grow every year. Um, one of my questions was whether the, the choice to eliminate Fridays as being open to the public was based on data, and it sounds like it is. Um, because this is, we're considering this as a press pause kind of budget year, um, do we, are we thinking that that hiring that part-time position is something that we should continue to keep as a goal perhaps for next year if next year's budget um, is, is more amenable to that? So I think, Megan, that um, it really is going to depend upon what the impact of the Friday closure is. So if um, the having those hours on Friday with her whole team without being interrupted by the phone and the um, and walk-in traffic allow Shelly to get everything done that needs to be done then and people are satisfied with four days at 7 30 to 4 30 or 5 30 I would think we could save that money and not bring that person back I don't think that opening five days a week and um, without bringing a body in um, is really a fair thing to contemplate. Um, because the things that we're seeing that Shelly needs to get to are not longstanding projects. They are part of daily operations that absolutely need to get done. And it's not fair to have somebody who is working on salary be expected to come in and work 50 plus hours a week on a sustained basis because we're understaffing uh, a department or not be able to take time off. And although she never complains, um, you know, that wasn't the deal when, when our town clerk went on salary. I think that, that people are going to really be getting used to um, limited hours of operation. And I'm sure that a lot of businesses in the community are gonna have to take a similar route um, as the gradual reopening and then re recovering from the economic crisis that we're in um, unfolds. So um, although I don't in theory like necessarily the idea of, um, of closing down for a day of the week, if it's going to really inconvenience a lot of residents or if it's gonna trouble a lot of residents, again, we have a tight budget in this department anyway and haven't been able to staff it appropriately anyway. And I think that it's a reasonable expectation for the public um, that we would be able to limit the hours to four days a week so that um, the, the staff could, could get the work done that they need to get done. And we have great <laughs> online services. <laughs> um, the, oh, go ahead, Sophie. Oh, I'm sorry. I would say just the other thing when you're talking about staffing to highlight for you is that we're walking into a fiscal year that's got a primary because it will be in July and um, a presidential election and um, a municipal election and a June election. So we're going to have four elections. One of them is a presidential general election, which normally in the elections line, you would see a five to six thousand dollar increase just to pay for the election clerks and uh, the training that goes along with that. So the reason you're not seeing that increase is because as part of the Friday closure, Shelley is suggesting that we can give up the intern position that we have hosted in this office, the paid intern position. So um, there is a, it's a balance here. And part of what you see, although it's an increase, it's a much smaller increase that we would normally see. And we're adding another election into the cycle because of the moving of the primary. Um, and Shelly, <laughs> just want to make an observation. Your narrative is like almost three pages long. The, the work, the amount of work that goes into this, my, and I don't, have a, I don't have a question, but looking at this, I just, I can't imagine we're only at a tier two service level and that's an amazing amount of work what is a tier three like are you like not ever going home and going to sleep um <laughs> but anyway um my other question was about voting as well are you being trained if we do if we do a vote by mail is that going to reduce some costs or are you i mean if if all of our 
all of our ballots are absentee ballots. Are you going, I mean, does that, is that going to change anything for you? I mean, I know it will change some things, but. Well, it certainly is going to change the level at which we engage with the um, voter. The concern that I have with the absentee by mail is it depends on how the statute or how the guidelines are written. If they require that an absentee ballot be sent mandatorily to every single voter on the list, then that is going to drive costs through the roof for all municipalities because right now if that was to be imposed for 10,700 voters, you would have to pay around a dollar 20 per absentee envelope to and back. So um, right now, because this is all being discussed and everyone's throwing ideas out, I can't really comment up or down. I just hope that when and if this is put forward, that folks use good judgment and not make it mandatory to every single person on the voting list. I hope that we follow the same request <coughs> format that we already have in place. Yeah, thank you, Shelley. Yes. Um, is there any monies being moved forward from because we didn't have the June election? Well, remember we had an extra March election. So um, I wouldn't, so at this point in time, number one, there isn't as much savings you'd think because the state gave us an extra election. Um, and number two, at this point in time, I don't have anything other than the contractual accounts that have to carry forward, like police tuition and, you know, things like that, carrying forward because we're trying to balance a significant revenue <coughs> against, uh, against um, underspending in the expense budget. So we, while I don't use the term freeze because I, I don't like that term you know we're here to do a job we need to do the job but there are things that we are electing not to do or to try to move forward into next year's work plan instead of this year's work plan. okay so the answer is no we're not carrying anything yeah. forward okay <laughs> we're so young on this so so the idea is that at seven, instead of eight o'clock, we're opening up at 730. That's why staff isn't working till two on Friday. So um, I don't, where are we seeing the, yes, it's whatever gets us to 40 hours at the end is where, is where Friday hours would come in, Cindy. So if, for example, somebody had to stay an hour to transact business with with somebody who was working and had to come in later, um, that person would only work on Friday until they hit 40. Um, so we're not budgeting for any overtime for this department. In elections, there's some overtime, but not in the department. Okay. Um, anyone else have any questions or comments? No. I would just... Uh, say that our town clerk is, it, it, she just does a phenomenal job in so many different things. And when you consider the amount of money and cash that she's responsible for bringing in over the counter that then goes to finance to be managed, it's, it's pretty incredible. And when people want to com compare what we've been doing in 2012, just in excise tax alone, we were at about $620,000 coming in over the counter. Those transactions are pretty small. We are now at over $800,000 coming in over the counter with less people than we were using in 2012 out there. So just putting things in perspective. Well, I think we're pretty lucky. Thank you, Shelly. Absolutely. Thank you. So Shelly, I have a question. Sure. Which, uh, it, it does seem untenable to, uh, and I don't think that Matt, Matt Dunlap was supportive of sending ballots to every registered voter, uh, but there, for the safety of your uh, poll workers and for the for the citizens, uh, people voting absentee is the best thing to do, and so the process of that is that a, a ballot is requested and it gets sent to the voter, so 
that doesn't have an added cost to you or does it to our sure town? It does. Okay, sure so that's the town of the, po the postage is the cost. So does this budget reflect the added cost if the majority of our voters actually did proceed with this, what would be good for our health, public health, which is to request an absentee ballot? Does this budget reflect the, co the extra cost of that to compared to we, that we usually have the majority of people walking in? Um, so at this point, the way the budget's being presented, we are expecting somewhere in the vicinity of about 15 to 30 percent, possibly, of an absentee voting force. During your 2016 presidential, we brought workers in over the weekend to process absentee ballots um, so that that was not an added burden on the presidential election day and that staff could focus on those duties. To say that we are going to be able to accommodate an influx of absentee ballots in this budget, I would say yes, if the request percentage stays relatively the same, Lori. If in fact there were different guidelines imposed or we had an uptick, there would be an increase in postage that we would probably see within the finance budget. So, um, there are some costs worked in and we would absorb some costs, but I can't at this point say to you how much it would be. I would really have to wait and see what the guidelines were around the absentee process because voters are going to do what the guidelines direct them to do. So in the past, we've had up to 30% absentee in a presidential year? I would say it would be between 20 and 30%. So it could be as much as 60% this time, perhaps. You know? I, I'm not sure. I have not seen any projections yet coming out of Augusta. Um, I can tell you that at the last presidential in 2016, we handled around 2,000 ballots absentee. The other thing I would just step in with is that if we are mandated to do anything around absentee ballots or the election if Matt Dunlap requires or the legislature governor require us to do that becomes a mandate and our argument would be that um, the state needs to use some of its CARES Act money to help offset that or whatever it is um, money to help offset that cost. Um, you know when I look at the amount of thought that went into putting these budgets together, I will admit we did not go out and ask um, questions about if we have $3,000 more in postage, I guess the thought at the end of the day is if it really, if it overran the total elections budget, which we can manage through, we had to close the town office for election day so that we could move staff that was on regular pay up there instead of hiring additional elections workers so that we could offset the cost of absentee balloting. I mean, those are choices we make all the time to try to stay within budget. So um, it's really hard to try to justify an increase based on an absolute unknown. Yeah. I say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good point to make. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to be coming down the road. But I will say that I trust the fact that we have the right person there to make sure that that process is going to seem seamless and, and done in a manner that, the um, reason why I say I really think Shelly is amazing. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you. Um, so it's 545 and we've got a meeting scheduled tomorrow so we could finish up with G so T tomorrow. My thought, Cindy, is ITGIS is the last section of this budget, correct? This section. Yeah. So we could get away without having a meeting tomorrow if we push through for five or ten extra minutes. Is that okay with everyone? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> we have <laughs> unanimous. unanimous. All right. Well, then we'll move back to Belle in her backyard. 
Anybody have questions for Bell or how you want to? So I know questions that people had last year um, were around the training budget. Um, and we have identified um, a network training course that our ITGIS person is taking. And um, that's actually helping reduce some of our consultant costs, costs our outside consultants, so that we can handle everything in-house. Um, and uh, he's taking the first section this year, and we'll take the second section next year. Um, also, in the um, budget, I don't know if you have looked at our parcel viewer map online recently. Um, we were one of the first communities to actually get this type of um, parcel viewer, and um, it's time for it to be updated. So that included in the, um, in the budget. If there's no budget line increase, we'll just not do a couple other things that we would normally do. I had a I had a couple of questions, Belle, on this one. Um, under consultant services, um, it says uh, this budget line allows IT department to contract with outside providers for expertise that is not provided in house. What would be an example of that? So um, we're pretty good at troubleshooting things that come up pretty regularly, but when it comes to like been trying to um, update our network equipment and when it comes to installing that programming it making sure that we have um, all the security measures online that we should um, we're not trained for that uh, you know we're not professional IT people we're IT GIS slash assistant town manager slash whatever else it is that we do people so um, we definitely need some help when it comes to that kind of thing. Okay. And it looks like we budgeted for 5,000 last year. We approved 5,000 last year, but only 4,500 this year, which is good. I mean, it's, it's going down, but how does this, how do you, how do we get this number? Like, where does this number come from? So we looked at, um, historical records. We've been able to, um, continue to decrease it. Um, but knowing that we have um, new cabling installation going in um, this year and um, a correction of the cabling installation proposed for next year um, in the public safety building, we knew that we could reduce it, but we weren't comfortable with, um, you know, having it or completely eliminating it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else have questions? It's not, not really a question, just an observation on the department um, having a, a very um, trim budget. Um, there's a reduction in about $100 in the overall department, but that is made possible with a lot of um, not insubstantial cuts in some areas in order to offset um, some necessary hardware upgrades in the uh, police department and also in the library. So um, these are necessary upgrades that we need to make. Um, computers are expensive, um, but uh, I think this, this budget does well to, to make cuts in other areas, uh, smart cuts, so that we are able to upgrade these systems uh, without, you know, uh, expanding the budget of the department. There, um, there is an error on the IT GIS um, budget under cable consortium on the TRIO um, report. There is $3,500 listed as the manager expense request. That is a legacy, so please disregard that. The, the uh, Excel spreadsheet with the comment is the correct one. We um, refocused that money actually to improving the broadcasting equipment um, within council chambers uh, so that <clears throat> once we are together and no longer using our own 
cameras that uh, we might be able to get some HD cameras in the um, council chambers and upgraded uh, systems in there so that everybody can see your lovely smiling faces instead of just a kind of a vague blur. I like the vague blur. <laughs> Okay, anyone else have anything? I would just say that um, I know ITS, uh, ITGIS might, it looks like, um, you know, it's an added cost in the budget, but um, once Bell kind of took the lead of that department, we've actually seen a pretty significant decrease in our reliance on consultants and not only a better service, and better support for the town, but also uh, she is finding really creative ways to save money. Um, she's doing a great job. Great. Okay. Um, so I think we're done with government, general government and administration. Um, I think everybody, gave a lot of information and I think we went through a lot of the budget. We'll, everybody can kind of process it. And if there's areas of cutting or you, anything that you really want to uh, see reduced, I would suggest sending it to Sophie so that she can work at it before presenting it to us. Um, anyone else have any comments before we go away? Thank you, Sophie, for doing all of this. <laughs> so our, our next meeting is when? So our next meeting, um, my, my assumption is that you don't want to meet, like you don't want to throw my whole schedule off. So we just yeah, won't absolutely. meet tomorrow. Um, so the Maybe. next one would be Monday at four. We're going to deal with public safety, police, and fire. Great. Um, so the, um, other thing that was on the agenda that you don't have in front of you, Cindy, is a brief town manager's report. So, um, I, I'm sure all council received, um, the email today from a group of citizens who want to recognize pride week, um, pride month. I, um, had a conversation with the council chair, um, that, the proposals that they have are problematic in terms of safety and in terms of our um, ability there. Um, the things that they are asking for specifically involved MDOT, which um, they have guidelines and guidance that we have to follow. However, um, what if we take a step back and say what they're really looking for is to celebrate pride to um, have the community come together, which is something that we can very much support. Um, and what they were saying in that um, entity is they wanted it to be very visible and that they were willing to take on the responsibility of doing it. Um, taking those thoughts, I um, reached out to Rob Yerksa and um, we did some brainstorming today. The visible place in the community that um, is on a main thoroughfare that we actually control is the center of the roundabout. And that doesn't mean we can do just about anything there, but it does mean that there's 21 um, cubic feet. Uh, Park Street. I'm sorry, Park Street, not, yes, Park Street. Um, there's 2,100 um, square feet of grass on that roundabout. And there's a whole lot of concrete that um, could be chalked or painted with a, with certain, within certain parameters. My recommendation to council is that we manage this like we manage most citizen requests, which is not to go through a council process. So when citizens come to Rob and to me and to say, hey, this is what we want to do, how can we make it happen? And we give them the parameters for how it can happen. And um, we've had a lot of success doing that. So my suggestion to Cindy was that I respond to this citizen group and let them know 
what we see as potentially meeting their needs and what the safety requirements would be for them to do something. Then I go have a conversation with code about the fact that this is a general town, non-town event, town bless non-town action event, and um, see what they come up with that is safe. We have also um, reached an agreement with the University of Maine to provide some bucket truck, donate some bucket truck time if they were to have any kind of flags that um, would go up. Rob would facilitate that for people. So that is trying to take what I heard from council and the desire for the community to take action. That's my suggestion for how we manage this. And I look for your input. Sophie, um, you may want to provide to them, um, I was just in, uh, kind of informed in, in, um, on the Board of Directors for Health Equity Alliance, and Dana Carver, she's actually a resident of Orono that is um, one of the directors there, and they have uh, determined there's a group of people around the state, everything from Portland all the way up to Northern Maine, are doing this really large virtual gay pride this year. Um, and it, it, it's, it's covering every, I mean, there's a lot of people involved in it and they could be part of that, I'm sure, in the conversation. And uh, Heal's uh, phone number is 990-3626. And is there a particular person, to, Terry, that I should direct them to? Yeah, Dana, Dana Carvar, uh, she, she's a Orno resident. Carvar? Carver. Carver. Carver, okay. She, actually, I think she lives in Old Town, but she's the, will be the contact person. All right, so if folks are okay with that, that's kind of the direction I'd like to take it. That way, town council isn't formally engaging and we are not gonna be setting any kind of precedent because we're just doing what we always do, which is help facilitate and allow people to somewhat bend local ordinances from time to time. Well, it seemed that this was a this was something sent to, to from a community group, and the part about the bridge. As soon as I read that, I thought, well, we don't. That's not us. That's the state. Do you have a person they can contact at the state about their idea about decorating the bridge? So, Lori, I think that um, their idea about decorating the bridge it's more than just it being the state. It's the fact that they want to take four by eight sheets of plywood and attach them without any engineering to rails. When you look at the boards that we put up, those were heavily engineered because of wind shear. So I wouldn't want to send somebody to the state if we were gonna turn around when that suggestion came back to us because the state will consult with us even though we're not, we don't have a legal right. And our, our public works director would say, we're very concerned about the safety of that. It just seems like setting people up to chase their tail and that just doesn't seem like a smart thing to do. So uh, then there was a discuss, suggestion the other night by Councillor Gardner about painting windows in the town. Uh, and so that sounded like a great idea, but I'll leave that's up to local business owners uh, that have the windows. And uh, I, I think it's a great idea for, and there's so many counselors that seem interested that we might th think of a way, obviously not for this year, but for the council to be supportive of this, this event and, and other, perhaps other events. Uh, so for this year, it's short notice and uh, it's obviously, but the government doesn't move at that rate that we would have something by June. So, uh, but I, I loved that the, there were people in town that were proposing to do something. I thought it was, it was really a wonderful thing. And I, I wanna thank them for uh, getting together and making a proposal because that's how we make our town better is for people to participate. So I really appreciate that. Okay, so Sophie, you've got direction on that. Is there anything else that you needed to update on us? Nope. Okay. Um, so we're not meeting tomorrow. So we'll meet again Monday the 18th and work on public safety 
um, police and fire. Yes. All right. So unless anyone else has anything to add, um, we're done. Have awesome. a good weekend. Right. See you on Monday. Thank you all. Bye.